Hey, what's up, everybody? I am glad you're checking this out. With the whole coronavirus and everything, unfortunately, our growth groups had to uh, cease for now, just temporary suspension. No, I'm not in trouble and everything. It's just uh, the whole social distance thing. Uh, six feet, it was weird because we were at the gas station the other day, which is an essential business, and they had the tape on the on the grounds. And so when I went to put the drinks up there and pay for the gas and everything, the lady at the counter had to back away as I walked up. And uh, it's just, it's crazy the times we're living in right now. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, just be safe out there. Be careful. Social distancing. Uh, while I understand uh, younger folks are tend to be not necessarily immune, but can handle the virus a lot better. They're not as susceptible. It is the younger folks that do also carry the virus and can contribute the virus to the older folks or those that are more susceptible and prone to receive it and have it affect them uh, more so. So we're trying to practice all the say, you know, social distance, the safe practice, uh, quarantine and everything else. So I figured and because I had already planned on doing this apologetic series, four week series for Easter, I figured I would just do the videos on it, put it out there. And if you'd like to check it out, by all means you have it. Uh, if not, by all means you got the freedom. So uh, this is just something that's been pretty influential to me. If you know anything about me, I'm very apologetically minded. And I love looking at the reasons why we believe what we believe. To allow people to realize and understand that it is not just a blind belief, a blind faith. But this is a faith, a religion, a relationship that is built upon trust, confidence, evidence. So that's what we're going to look at today. So this four-week apologetic series over Easter is going to cover these four main areas. Today we're going to talk about the reliability of the New Testament and the eyewitness of the New Testament. Next, we're going to talk about the historicity of Jesus Christ. Was Jesus of Nazareth a real living person? Was he who he said he was? Then we're going to look at what day was Jesus actually crucified. Was he crucified Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? How do we know? Can we know? And does it even matter if we know? And then finally, what is the minimal facts resurrection? What does it mean, the minimal facts of the resurrection? And then what are the different competing theories, secular theories, atheist theories, I should say, on why is that tomb empty? One of the facts of the minimal facts of, for the resurrection is the fact that most people believe that tomb was empty. So where did the body of Jesus go? So we're going to look at that. That's going to be the fourth one. Uh, these we're going to tie up and lead all the way up to Easter Sunday. But again, Corona, COVID-19 had other ideas and plans for that. So this is just going to be the other medium that we're going to use for it. So jumping right in. New Testament eyewitness accounts, the reliability of the New Testament, even the entirety of the Bible, not only from secularists, but even those theologians and scholars are somewhat poking holes into the fact of the New Testament, uh, specifically the Gospels, uh, were not eyewitness accounts. They're not eyewitness accounts. You see, Alan Callahan, which you could read right there, Harvard Divinity School is associate professor in New Testament, says, if we want to read the Gospels as eyewitness accounts, historical records, and so on, then not only are we in for some tough going, I think there's evidence within the material itself that it's not intended to be read that way. So here's a professor at a prestige, prestigious school teaching that the New Testament writings, the Gospels, the Pauline epistles, Johannine epistles, whatever the case is, are not eyewitness accounts. So we're going to talk about that. Look at that. Bart Ehrman, in his book, Misquoting Jesus, says, The dim reality is that we really don't have know for sure who wrote these New Testament writers. We simply create a little fiction in our minds that we are reading the actual words of Mark or Paul or First Peter and then get on the business with interpretation. It's harmless fiction. And it's not just these people. A famed... Uh, English, uh, I believe he's English, uh, the Ang Anglican Bishop of Durham, uh, New Testament scholar N.T. Wright says, I don't know who the gospel authors are, nor does anyone else. And so we're seeing more and more, and if you were to read more of N.T. Wright's stuff, he, he can get out there sometimes with his teachings and his philosophy, his doctrines. 
is not just in secular camps, it's also creeping into theology, uh, theologians, New Testament scholars, critical scholars, that the New Testament is not a reliable historical record. And this is just becoming pervasive. And we know this was going to happen because Paul talks about warnings against doctrines of devils and vain philosophies and deceits and stuff like that near the end times. And so we're seeing more and more and more of this attack upon scripture and upon God's words. So we're really going to see, is there evidence that the New Testament authors were eyewitnesses? And is it reliable? You see, one of the basic claims about Jesus was not that he was divinity, was not that he was God, but that the claims in the New Testament were basically made up legends to beef up Christianity's claims. So that people would look at the religion of Christianity and say, wow, that religion is a lot more powerful than Buddhism or Hinduism or Islam or whatever the case is. And so, again, they reject the supernatural, they reject the miracles of Jesus Christ and say these were just fabricated stories to beef up Christianity's claims. So while Christianity, a couple of things to remember, while Christianity was established due to an event, not the Bible, the first Christians did not have the Bible. They did have scriptures. They had the Old Testament. They didn't have the canon that we know right now. It was established based upon an event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Being the fact that we're 2,000 years removed from Christ, everything we know about doctrines and essentials of Christianity, we know of because of the Bible, God's revelation of himself to us, and then some early church creeds. So does the book that we actually circle around tell the true story of Jesus and God reaching the world? Is the Bible, the New Testament, specifically the gospel, is reliable? And if the Bible was proven to be unreliable and untrustworthy, how would we know about Messiah? How would we know about Jesus? How would we know about salvation? Again, we're 2,000 years removed from the cross. So everything we know about the cross, we read about in the Bible, and there's some early church father writings. So if all that was proved to be unreliable, would Christianity have a leg to stand on? It's kind of interesting if you think about that. But let me ask you this. Think about it. If you had only one book of the Bible to use to witness to a seeking unbeliever, which book would you use to reach him? I've always said I would use the book of Daniel just because of its prophetic nature and how a lot of prophecies are actually uh, fulfilled. But most people would say the Gospel of John because it's the most evangelistic book. Think about this. What if John didn't write the Gospel of John? What if John really wasn't there? What if John was historically inaccurate? What if the gospel was unreliable? How do you know that the gospel of John or any other gospel is or is not reliable? How do you know? Have you ever thought about that? What are the tests and the methods used to employ to see if something is reliable? And that's what we're going to talk about. But I can assure you of this. Not only the four Gospels that we'll talk about, but every book of the Bible is reliable. Now we can say it's all God-breathed and because God gave it through the Holy Spirit's inspiration through the penmanship of man. That we know because it's God's word, it is reliable, it is trustworthy, it never changes. Can we test these writings? Can we test the authors? Can we test those that are giving these eyewitness accounts that they were truly there and that it was not a made-up legend? It's quite interesting when you think about that, when you look at the logic and the reason side of it. But let me ask you this. Do you truly know who penned the Gospels? N.T. Wright said we have no idea who wrote the actual Gospels. You see, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, neither one of them say this is the Gospel according to Matthew. It's early church fathers that ascribe the authorship of the Gospel of Matthew to Matthew or Luke to Luke, whatever the case is. None of them actually claim direct authorship. It's quite interesting when you think about it. So who penned Hebrews? Was it Paul, Barnabas, Apollos? Was it somebody else? We don't know. Does it matter who penned Hebrews? Does it matter who's the author, the man author, the man author, the human author of Hebrews? 
if you believe it was Paul that wrote Hebrews and we later find something that points it to Barnabas, does everything you once believed doctrinally from the book of Hebrews change? Or does it still stay the same just because you believed it was Paul but it found out to be Barnabas? Does that mean the words, the writing, the teaching is unreliable? Again, just some things to think about. So, New Testament reliability. Something to think about. You have your synoptic gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're called synoptic gospels because they tend to agree. And then you have John on its own. Out of the four gospels, only two of them were actual apostles during the earthly ministry, Matthew and John. The other two were not apostles. We're told in church tradition teaches that they compiled their gospels by consulting other gospels and wit not witnessing but uh, interviewing other people like Peter or Matthew, whatever the case is. And so two of the gospel writers were there during the direct ministry of Jesus Christ. Two of them were not apostles. And so it's interesting when you're looking at the eyewitness, but just because they weren't there during the earthly ministry, Mark and Luke, doesn't mean that they're not eyewitness accounts. What it just means was they interviewed eyewitnesses and they used that to compile their gospel, their good news of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to find a little bit out, uh, more out about Luke and when he actually uh, met up with Paul and uh, Barnabas. So whether or not the traditional authorship of the Gospels is found inaccurate, it's the actual writing. It's the words on the page that's used to determine the reliability. If, for instance, the Gospel of Matthew said, I, Matthew, the Apostle of Jesus Christ, write this account, and we find out that Matthew didn't actually write it, then that would cause be a cause of concern for the authorship, the penmanship, and the writings within the Gospel of Matthew, which is why we have issues with pseudopigraphy graphical works, which is like the book of Enoch, the book of Jasher, stuff like that. But if it's not directly uh, coined as their writing, just because we don't know the traditional authorship per se, it's not that that we're testing. We're testing the actual writing in black and white, the red, in the Gospels to see if it's reliable and if that is eyewitness account. So how do we test whether or not the Gospels are accurate or eyewitness accounts? Well, I'm going to use uh, someone that I've used for a long time, and I love his writings, J. Warner Wallace. But remember, even if... Sorry, these slides got a little out of order. I was trying to do some edits a minute ago, but even if we throw out four of the Gospels, and say, okay, they were not uh, reliable. They were found historically inaccurate. Even if we throw four Gospels out, we still have 62 books of the Bible. And out of those 62 books, we still have sufficient information for all theologies. Theology proper, which is the study of God the Father. Christology, study of Christ. Pneumatology, study of the Spirit. Homarchiology, study of sin. Soteriology, the study of salvation. Uh, Satanology, angelology, and then eschatology, end times. So even if we were to take out the four Gospels and set them aside, we still have enough writings to determine all the doctrines of Scripture. So like I said, J. Warner Wallace, Cool Case Christianity. This was, as far as apologetics is concerned, this is one of the most influential books that I've read. Now basically, J. Warner Wallace is a former homicide detective, many years as a homicide detective. And basically, like Lee Strobel, he takes a homicide detective approach to go ahead and test the veracity and the tr trustworthiness of Scripture. And in the end, he comes across and comes to the cl conclusion that the Bible is what the Bible claims to be, the written revelation of God, and he becomes a believer. So we're going to use some methods out of his book. Four areas that he says as a homicide detective to test the reliability of a witness to a crime was, one, were they present? Were they there? Did they truly, were they at the scene saying they saw what they said they saw? Two, can we prove they were there? Do they have verifiable or falsifiable information? Three, do they have a reason to lie or an ulterior motive? 
is there something about the relationship with the defendant or prosecutor or whatever the case is to give us a reason why they would lie and for do the eyewitnesses uh, all the witnesses to a crime do they all line up perfectly because that's going to be interesting when we talk about that but first were they present J. Warner Wallace says that witnesses have to be able to provide evidence that they were on the scene when the crime occurred. And the detectives have to try to determine through their testimony and other witnesses if they were actually present there. And so when we're looking at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we're looking at the synoptic gospels. We see like with Matthew that he's a, it had to have been written before AD 70, the Jerusalem temple destruction. Because with Matthew being a very Jewish-centric book, a very much a Jewish-influenced book, there's nothing about the Jewish temple destruction in his writings. We would imagine that the most pivotal moment of the day, of the first couple hundred years of Christianity, of Israel's history during that first century, the Jerusalem temple destruction, that that would have been written about if this was fabricated or made up. Another interesting thing is that in Matthew's Gospel, Luke actually references some of Matthew's writings. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. And so, as far as Matthew is concerned, there's internal evidence to show that Matthew is a very early writing prior to A.D. 70, which would put Matthew, the Apostle of Jesus Christ, there during the earthly ministry. What about Mark? See, J. Warner Wallace has an interesting take on this. Some people believe that Matthew was the first gospel written. Some people believe it was Mark. J. Warner Wallace looks at Matthew similar to what he calls a crime broadcast, which what he says, a crime broadcast is where details are gathered. Uh, Once a detective, homicide detective, goes up on the scene, he just gets some quick data. What happened? You know, who are the suspects? Whatever the case was. And then later, does he dive into all the information and the details to try to put together a broader picture? So with Mark, with all the action verbs, with all the action writing, all the immediately uh, type words, it's no doubt that this is an action-packed book, that it seems to be very abrupt. J. Warner Wallace believes that there's a sense of urgency in the gospel and the fact that Mark wanted to hurry up and write it down and get it out because of the imminency of the return of Jesus. They didn't know when Jesus was going to return after the resurrection, so he wanted to hurry up and write it down and get it out. Plus, what's interesting is it seems like Mark actually tries to hide and protect some of the key figures of the church, whether it's Peter, whether it's some of the women, whatever the case is. And then Luke actually quotes from Mark and from Matthew in the early first few uh, verses of his gospel. And so we know that Mark's gospel had to have been written before Luke's gospel. The same with Matthew, because Luke references both of them, quotes from both of them. And so it had to have been an early writing. What about Luke? Sorry, I got distracted for a minute. I just got a guy that's outside my house taking pictures of my yard. (laughs) Oh no, I'm assuming it's the appraisal guy. Yeah, we're trying to sell a house, so. Luke doesn't mention the deaths of Paul, Peter, or James. And so, that's interesting because influential figures of the church, of the religion that early was established... Paul, Peter, and James were highly influential leaders. Peter was pretty much the top dog, top apostle. Paul was the apostle uh, to the Gentiles. And James, I believe, was the pastor of the Jerusalem church. They were all influential, and they all died uh, early on in the first century. Well, not early in the first century, but nowhere does Luke actually record their deaths. Paul even quotes Luke in his letter to Timothy and calls it Scripture pointing to the fact that Luke's gospel was written prior to Paul's death. Paul even quotes Luke in his letter to the Corinthians as well. So Luke had to have been written prior to Paul's death, prior to Peter and James's death as well. 
and he again used Mark and Matthew, uh, quote some of their writings, to go ahead and compile his own. So were they present? I would argue, yes, there's evidence that Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels are early writings prior to A.D. 70, prior to 67, actually, when Peter and Paul uh, traditionally are believed to have died and been martyred. So I do believe that three, the Synoptic Gospel authors, were all there and present. The next area is, do they provide verifiable or falsifiable information? See, a homicide detective says a witness story can be verified by alibis, time, location, details about witnessing a crime. Is there anything there that they can give that can be tested and proven to be true? And just because one detail may be off doesn't necessarily mean that the entire witness's uh, testimony loses credibility. But the more details that are off, the more unreliable they become. There are many historical details given in the four Gospels. These are just going to be a collection of them, but there are many details about the early church, about the time period in the first century with Rome and Jerusalem, that is verifiable through history and archaeology. For instance, in early chapter of, uh, of uh, Luke, we were, we're told that it was because of a taxing case census that not Matthew, but Joseph and Mary come to Bethlehem. We say it was during the governor of Quirinius in Syria. Of Syria. Now, many people say that, well, see, historically inaccurate, Quirinius was never a governor of Syria. You see, we got you pegged. That's a historically inaccurate writing in the Gospel of Luke. He got it wrong. And so there's two ways of looking at it. Number one, if you read on the bottom, we can see that Quirinius, according to the Deeds of Augustus, which was written by Roman historian Tacitus, that Quirinius was a official as early as 12 BC, as early as 12 BC of Syria. And so we have found, or well not we, but they have found other writings, extra biblical writings, from people that are contrary to Christianity that says Quirinius was actually in 12 BC. Uh, an official of Syria during that time. But there's another way we could take this text as well. Though Quirinius possibly may not have been technically a governor until after Christ, the primary definition for governor in the Greek is that H word right there. <laughs> I'm not going to try to pronounce it. And it means leader or ruler. And it's also, it's not a noun. If you look at it in the parsing, it's not a noun. It's actually a present tense verb, meaning that it's not governor of Syria. It's rather governor, governing, governing Syria. I could not say that word worth nothing. And so it was while Quirinius was governing Syria. And so with the primary definition being a ruler or a leader, he's some sort of official leader in Syria during that time. This is verifiable. This is historical evidence that can pinpoint and put whoever Luke was getting this eyewitness detail from, they could put them there on the scene. Matthew, Matthew 27, verse, tw verse 12, identifies Pontius Pilate as the governor or the prefect of Judea. This was unknown until archaeology discovered the Pontius Pilate stone in a Roman theater in Caesarea. So this again, I love how archaeology continues to uh, give evidence to Christianity. The Pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5 mentions it says it was near the Sheep Gate. And in the late 1800s, guess what they unearthed? What they believed to be the Pool of Bethesda. Guess where? Near the location of the Sheep Gate. Again, this is verifiable historical evidence that says, yes, these people were there early. They know about the details. In John chapter 19, verse 31. The time of the Passion of the Christ. That week prior to his death, his crucifixion. Says that Passover uh, occurs annually on the 15th of Nisan for seven days. And this year it's actually 8 to 16 April. And it was considered a high Sabbath during that Passover in John 1931. And it's considered a high Sabbath. It's more holy than the typical Sabbath because it fell during Passover. So this gives us some insight as to the day of the week Jesus was crucified, which is what we're going to talk about on the third video I want to say. And so this is another piece of evidence, historical evidence, verifiable evidence that we can see if the eyewitnesses were there. Can we put them on scene? 
Well, they say during the crucifixion, it was during the Passover period, and that Sabbath was a high Sabbath during that time. What about the empty tomb? The empty tomb is verifiable as well. Luke 24, 3, the women, when they went rushed to the tomb, they did not find the body of Jesus. And to this day, there's no satisfactory response. We'll talk about this in the fourth video as to where is Jesus' body? What happened? Minimal facts resurrection pretty much identifies that one of the uh, one of the accepted facts surrounding Christ is that the tomb was empty. Nobody can provide sufficient evidence or justification on where the physical body of Christ is. And we'll talk about that. And so there's verifiable information there. All they had to do in the first century was show the body, reveal the body, and they couldn't do it. So do they provide verifiable evidence? Yes. Quirinius, the governor of Syria, Pontius Pilate, Stone, Pool, Bethesda, the Passion of the Christ, and the empty tomb theory. And it says there, each of these could be refuted if it was found untrue, but extra-biblical writings like Tacitus, as well as archaeology with the Pool of Bethesda and Pontius Pilate Stone continue to corroborate this information. There is plenty of verifiable evidence in the Gospels. If they're trying to make it up or trying to look back into history, I imagine there's going to be a lot of details that were left out because the more details they put, the more likelihood that they will be found inaccurate. And so the fact that there's so much detail in there gives credence to the reliability the fact that they were actual eyewitnesses to the earthly ministry of Jesus. What about number three? Do these witnesses have a reason to lie? You see, J. Warner Wallace mentions that witnesses will sometimes lie to defend, whether the prosecutor, defendant, whoever the case is, for money, for fear, relationship, bias, whatever the case is. So they're always looking at this witness given testimony. Could there be any reason why they're biased? Could there be any reason why they, they would be making this up? So what about the gospel writers? Think about this. Of the New Testament authors, the majority were Jewish, most likely in Judaism. Matthew, Mark, John, Paul, Peter, James, Jude. Upon Jesus' arrival, they were unsure of his claims as Messiah on who he was. When Jesus began preaching and doing miracles, it upset the establishment. It upset the religious leaders of the day. When the disciples began preaching Jesus, it continued to upset the leaders. Their message even led to the great dispersion. Acts chapter 8, read about it. it led to the martyrdom of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Paul, Peter, James, John the Baptist were all martyred for their message of Christ. And even if you read the book of Acts, you read about Paul and Barnabas, you see how the Jewish leaders continually go town to town to town, sort of like chasing Paul and Barnabas around the area. Do the apostles have a reason to lie? Common sense dictates no. It makes zero sense whatsoever for these Jewish men to make up Christianity, to make up this lie, to make up this resurrection story of Jesus Christ. Again, they were they were fishermen, they were tax collector, they had comfortable lives possibly, they were under the control of Rome, uh, they were probably in the Jewish synagogue. They lost everything. They were ostracized. They lost jobs, they lost family, they lost their homes, they were chased out of their area. They even lost their lives and some their heads for this. If you were to make up a religion, would you make up a religion or would you make up a lie to bring you under great persecution and then to continue that lie? That makes zero sense whatsoever. And so, do they have a reason to lie to make all this up? No. They had a reason to tell the truth because something happened with that empty tomb. That Christ's body was gone and that they seen the physically risen Savior. But what about four? Do their stories align? You see, as common, J. Warner Wallace points out, for two or more people to give an account, to have different points of views and details, and even omissions, is actually very alarming if two witnesses give the exact same story, the exact same details, and omit the exact same information. Because there you can see that they sort of 
planned the story out. They created this story and they're giving the same information. They think that the closer the stories align, the more likelihood is that they're both telling the truth. But if you and I see an accident, then we're going to tell the accident from different points of views. You'll mention some things I don't and vice versa. But if you want to lie and say we saw an accident, our details are going to be eerily similar. And it's going to be almost uncanny how similar they are. But what about this New Testament Gospels? Well, the Beatitudes, Matthew and Mark are the only ones that write about it. So we see omissions and inclusions. We see that Mark and John don't write about the Beatitudes. When Jesus walks on water, Luke doesn't mention it. Unpardonable sin isn't mentioned by John. Zacharias and Elizabeth and John the Baptist and everything was only written by Luke. Parable of the Cloth and Wineskins was only written by Mark and Luke. This is just a small selection. But when you're looking at the four Gospels, the reason why they don't align is because they're telling them from their point of view as the Holy Spirit dictated their writing. And so they're not necessarily going to align up perfectly. We are looking at the women of the cross. Who all was there? People see a contradiction between Mark and John. But again, it's a point of view that they're referencing and talking about. What about the women at the tomb? Matthew and Mark. What about the details of resurrection morning? Again, they don't align perfectly because it's not made up stories. Each of them is accurate. Each of them is telling from their point of view or the eyewitness detailed point of view that they're getting the information from as far as Mark and Luke is concerned. So do their stories align? Yes. They align because their overall message of the redemption, the message of Christ, the resurrection, it's only through their own points of view and their style. The omissions and the inclusions on different areas and different gospel writers they go a long way in confirming the legitimacy. The last thing we would want to see with all four gospel writers is for the stories to match almost to the T. The fact that there's differences in seemingly contradictions go to show that they're writing from their point of view and they're mentioning some things where this person isn't. And this person's focusing on this area while this person on that area. There's very there's a lot of evidence to give credibility and reliability to the authorship and to the reliability and the eyewitness accounts of the New Testament. There was zero motivation to create this Christian religion when the day of Judaism was there. All the details aligned with each other. In the first century, evidence could have easily been disproven. However, even still seen with the physical res resurrection in the body of Christ, that still has yet to be the case. There has never been disproven details in the first century of any of this information. So, is the New Testament, is the Gospels historically accurate, reliable, and were the Gospel writers actually there? I would argue, yes, they were. And we can trust that we have a reliable New Testament, reliable Gospel uh, accounts through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John through those four main areas. So I hope you enjoyed this first one. Like I said, the next three is going to be, was Jesus Christ really a historical person? Then what day of the week was Jesus Christ actually crucified? I, again, like I said, the high Sabbath is a interesting fact. Not only that, but if you want to do some read ahead, the third day, okay? Jesus was going to be risen on the third day. That's very important in discerning what day of the week it was. And then what is the minimal facts resurrection and an empty tomb theories? What's the, uh, the swoon theory? What's the stolen body theory? The misplaced body theory? Whatever the case is. So we'll talk about all that. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it. You know, uh, hopefully you guys stay safe. And hopefully this uh, self-quarantine and the social distancing gets lifted soon enough. But until then, just take care of yourselves. Be safe. Let me know in the comments or anything. If you have any ideas, questions, comments, critiques, or concerns. And I just thank you for checking this out. Forward it on to anybody that you think might find uh, use in this. Again, this is a cursory review. I'd recommend J. Warner Wallace, Cool Case Christianity, if you want to know more about this. So uh, just take care, and we'll see you all soon.